as we come to worship this morning, um, I want to welcome you to, to our service. Uh, we are glad that you were here, that you were not home getting all of your snacks and everything ready for, because I, I understand there's a ball game this afternoon. Um, but we are glad that you were here this morning. Uh, as we begin worship, Eddie Boyce has an announcement for us. Good morning. Good morning. Got awfully quiet there. Everybody toned down all of a sudden. Um, I just have one thing to, to, to announce uh, today. Uh, today, I'm delighted to announce that Pastor Don has agreed to, to, to continue his role as our interim pastor for another six months. I know that uh, a lot of you... I know many of you have been anxious about where we are in the call process, and I want to assure you that things are continuing to progress behind the scenes. But uh, given where we are right now in the current situation, it made sense to the board, to the PEC, and, and to Pastor Don that he would continue to keep things going as, as is for, for the next few months here. So I want to thank Pastor Don and Anita, uh, both for their willingness to be with us in ministry as we continue. And thank you very much. I want to say thank you to the board and to all of you for your encouragement and your reception of us for these past few months. And we are looking forward to extending, um, as the board was talking about this the other week, they, they had a question. They said, is this okay with you? And I'm like, yes. And then, and then Harold said, you sure you don't want to extend it through football season? Um, <laughs> I told him we'll wait and see how the Wake Forest football team is. <laughs> I did get a um, call last night from the basketball, from Steve Forbes, the Wake Forest basketball coach, saying that I have to stay through at least basketball season because we were at the game last night. I had three heart attacks, uh, <laughs> but we were able to pull it out. It was ugly, 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 but a win is a win is a win. Thank you. Thank you for allowing us to continue this journey with you, and we look forward um, to the next few months together. As we continue in worship, there are some announcements we need to make. You know, remember last, uh, last Sunday, our Boy Scouts were with us, telling us about all the things they have going on, and part of it was their food drive. I don't know about you, but I kept thinking, well, how much food did we get? Jonathan, do you want to tell us how much? Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I'm Jonathan from Truth 944, and I wanted to thank everyone for helping donate for scouting for food. Uh, we collected 2,056 pounds of food, which exceeded our goal of 2,000 pounds. Thank you. Congratulations. And that is not just congratulations for them, but congratulations to our congregation. To our community, that food will be going to crisis, ministry, crisis control ministries to help feed those in our community who are under shock and a lot more stress when they try to go to the grocery store. Um, those are our Boy Scouts. Next month, in a couple weeks, we will be hearing from our Girl Scouts. Uh, they're still selling cookies on Saturday, so if you're running low of Thin Mints, this is your opportunity to get them. <laughs> Um, if you notice in our, in our worship guide, um, some of you may have not gotten your uh, report in for our church council. Those are due on Friday. But being a grace-filled church, we will accept them. Uh, if you have not gotten them in, if you will get it in tomorrow. Uh, that will help Linnell compile those so that we will have them on the 19th. Please note in our worship guide that a memorial service will be held for, for Bill Milstead uh, this week on the 15th uh, at Pierce Jefferson Funeral Home. Uh, Bill passed away several weeks ago, and an internment will be at a later date. But uh, please be in prayer for all of those who loved him. Um, invite you to join us on, on the 15th. 
There are a lot of distractions today, aren't there? So much going on in our world. That little football thing going on. But as I shared with our choir before we came in, this is our opportunity to focus on what is truly, truly important. So may we take a deep breath, center our lives so that we might meet God in this time.
if you come and hang out here in my office, you can hear Chris practice this. And so I've heard pieces of it all week long. Chris, thank you so very, very much. Will you join me in our call to worship? Old commandment, that we should love each other. And it is in this our law for one another that the world will know whom and what we worship. Come, children of God, let us love one another. We join us as we sing together hymn 485, standing if you are able. <laughs> be seated. Our gospel lesson today comes from the 15th chapter of John, where you hear these words of our Lord. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer because the servant does not know what the master is doing. 
But I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my Father. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I have appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. I'm giving you these commands so that you may love one another. This is the word of our Lord. Let us pray together. It seems you're a simple God. You have told us what to do. Love one another. It's one of the first verses we learned in vacation Bible school. It's been written on pictures hung on the refrigerator doors, on cards that we have sent, on worship bulletin covers. It seems so simple. You would think we know it by now, and yet, yet God, it is so hard. It is hard. It's hard to love them, those people who aren't like us, who don't treat us well, who are mean to us, who are against us, against you, or at least our interpretation of you. God, it's hard to love them. And God, it's hard to love when our hearts are broken, when we don't know what to do. 
We've experienced that this week as we have seen the horrific aftermath of the earthquakes in Turkey and Syria. Homes, schools, mosques, hospitals, all collapsing in a few terrifying seconds. We have watched as crews have dunk, dug, seeking to find some miracle. Uh, a child, a person, still hoping to be found. There were 29,000 victims so far. Our hearts break because we know your heart breaks, and yet, God, we don't know what to do. We don't know how to love. And this week, we have learned that one of your ministers, one of our own, who has worked to deliver aid to people in places that we would be hard-pressed to find on a map, has been imprisoned for, we're not even sure why he's been in prison. And so this day, we do pray for Ryan Kohler and his family and all who seek his freedom. Love one another. Love one another. That's your commandment to us. It's not a suggestion, not a piece of advice, but the very mark of our discipleship. And we confess that too often we fail. Forgive us, O Lord. Soften our hearts even this day so that we might love as you love giving of our very selves so that your love might encompass and transform us and our world, even this day. Amen. In a few weeks, we're going to have an opportunity to express our love through our Moravian Day of Giving. And Eddie is going to come and bring us some words about that. And one of those things that I forgot to mention during the welcome, I hope that you see it at the very top. Today on your pew are our friendship registers that are making their appearance. This is a super, super day for that. And so we invite you at some point during the service to pass those. This would be a good time, even as you're paying attention to Eddie. Eddie. more time. Um, last week in your bulletin you got this little insert talking about the uh, Moravian uh, Day of Giving which is Tuesday the 21st of February, Fat Tuesday. Um, there's an incentive to participate in this program and, and we want to be part of that. Uh, basically the congregation, the congregation that gets the most amount of participants that is, the most amount of folks who contribute to that congregation on the 21st will get a grant of $10,000. Uh, the congregation, I, I think, that gets the second most gets $5,000, and the third most gets $2,500. That's a, a free, unrestricted grant. We're asking everybody in the congregation to participate. On that day, on the 21st, Fat Tuesday, um, there's a... Um, uh, link in the in the bulletin shows you where to go there. The other thing I'll tell you is that if you go to the church website, Current Central Moravian Church website, at the very bottom, if you scroll down to the very bottom of the home page, there's a link to the um, to the foundation uh, link for for Current Central Moravian. It goes directly to the portal where you can contribute for us. And again, it's the number of participants. It's not the amount. Any amount counts. Okay. Uh, so we'd like everybody to take advantage of that uh, on the 21st. Thank you very much. This is a two-prong thing. One is that it gives us an opportunity to share in the ministries that we do literally around the world. It is one of those things that helps us. Uh, our Mer Bethany Cafe got their seed money from the Moravian Foundation. Um, but as you heard, it's it's a little selfish. We could get something back, so let's be honest about that. So we do hope that you will participate. On the 21st, don't go this afternoon. It won't count. I mean, you can, but we want you to go on the 21st as well. That is just one way in which we give, in which we are allowed to participate in God's ministry to our world. Another is our weekly tithes and offerings, and we have that opportunity now. 
So we pray that you will be generous as we give together. Our second scripture lesson is one in which we have all heard before, from 1 Corinthians 13, where you hear these words of our Lord. If I speak in the tongues of mortals and angels but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, if I have faith so to remove mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions, and if I hand over my body so that I may boast but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. But as for prophecy, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part. But when the complete come, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now, we see in a mirror dimly. But then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part. Then I will know fully even as I have been fully known. For now, faith, hope, and love abide. These three, and the greatest of these, is love. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. The choir has sung it. We have heard it from Scripture. We have an opportunity to sing it together. Our hymn number 590. Please join us and stand if you are able.
Please be seated. As a part of our continuing service to you, I want to bring you this important reminder. Today is February 12th. I know it's Super Bowl Sunday, but don't be lulled into sleep. There are only two more days until Thanksgiving, until Valentine's. (laughs) I have been lulled into sleep. Two days until Valentine's Day. You have probably waited way too long already, so don't wait any longer. Go out now and buy your candy, your flowers, your cards. Go now. No, 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 no. Wait until after the service and then go immediately to do that. Because you see, and here I may be a little bit confessional, too often we wait until the last minute. We rush out to the grocery store at 10.50 on February 13th and then are astonished that there aren't any more cards left. Of course, it's easier. It's easier when there are only three cards. What do you mean? All you have left is a great-grandmother card. (laughs) And it's precisely our desire not to have to make that choice that keeps us from doing that, right? Going out and shopping. So this morning... I want to help you with that, to help you with your choices, to at least narrow them down. Because you see, if you go to that rack, there's so many there. How do you choose? Well, you can decide to go with the funny card, like one that says, Valentine, you give me that loving feeling. Of course, sometimes you give me that I want to kick you in the butt feeling, but we won't talk about that. Or perhaps you would prefer a cute card, and can you do any better than, than Snoopy and his bird friends? Happy Valentine's Day to someone who's sweet, precious, enjoyable, charming, wonderful, adorable, loving. Actually, you're better than that, but I ran out of birds. Or the sentimental one. You can always find that sentimental one, that one that is so sweet, you almost need to call your dentist before you give it. You stepped out of my dreams and into my life, turning all that I had ever hoped for into reality. You stepped out of my dreams and found a way to touch my heart like it's never been touched before. You stepped out of my dreams and showed me that love the way it was meant to be, and now... Now I know that you and you alone are the love of my life, my dream come true. (laughs) And of course, of course, there's always the sexy card. Let's get naked and watch a baseball game. (laughs) Oh wait, there's no baseball in February. And here we are, naked, with nothing to do. (laughs) You see, there are all kinds of cards that you can choose today. Choose it today, because come Tuesday, you don't want to be left empty-handed. And nothing says love like a $2.50 card. (laughs) At least that's what we have been led to believe. Of course, that goes along with our mythic view of love. You know the scene. You've seen it so many times in the movies. Boy meets girl. Through many funny, tragic events, they fall in love, they overcome obstacles, and finally drive off into a blissful sunset. It's wonderful, romantic, and so not true. It's part of the myth that we have, though, about love, isn't it? Thomas Merton wrote about that strange way we have about talking about how we fall in love. He said, We speak of falling in love as though love were something like water that collects in pools, lakes, rivers, and oceans. You fall into it or just walk around it. Our expression suggests that an unforeseen mishap. You're at a party. You've had more drinks than you need. You decide to walk around the garden for a while, and you don't notice the swimming pool. And all of it once, you have to swim. Fortunately, they fish you out, and you're wet, but none the worse for for the wear. But then he continues, but sometimes, 
Sometimes the pool is empty. You, then you don't just get wet, you just rack your skull or break your arm. You see, to talk about falling in love is to say that love, love is an accident. It, it just happens to you. That's just one of the myths we have about love. There, there is that other one, that myth that says that somewhere in the world, Somewhere in the world, there is that one person, that one person who is just perfect for me. And if I can, I can just meet him or her, then I will be in love and they will love me and all will be well with the world. What a fatalistic view of the world, don't you think? It's the one that I was told growing up. There's that one person, that one person who will be perfect for you it goes along with the idea that God has our lives all mapped up and, and that sometime, sometime, when I'm a campus ministry intern at Virginia Tech, I will meet that one person. But, but what if that person doesn't get the message? <laughs> what if she, she goes and marries someone else? Or what if they're hit by a bus? Or what if their parents decide to be agriculturalists in China and I never get to meet her? What happens to me then? Again, see, this goes with the idea that love, love is just fate. I don't have any responsibility to it. Don't blame me if things don't work out. You weren't the right person. There was someone else that I should have married. See, it just happens. And then there's the myth that says that love is the way I feel when I see you. And some of you may still be young enough to understand that and remember that. That when I see you, I get all squishy inside. And I want to throw up just to show how much I love you. <laughs> Do you remember those days? And then we get married, and we settle down, we buy a house, we have a kid or two or five, and then we wake up one morning, and it's like, whoa, I've lost that loving feeling. I mean, how can you feel loving when there are children running around the house in the middle of the night, and you have a big presentation due tomorrow morning? The car needs the oil changed, and the washing machine is on the blink, and your spouse has a really bad case of morning breath. I mean, there are times that I don't have that loving feeling. Life has just sucked it out of me. So where are we? Where are we as we head into Valentine's Day facing all these myths? If love is not an accident, if it's not fate, if it's not a feeling, then what is it? When you ask that question in church, you hear our scripture lesson this morning, don't you? We know this passage. People know this passage. Even if someone is not religious, they know this passage. When I meet couples who are thinking about getting married, who are planning their service, even if they have not been to church since the, their cousin on their mother's side, third remove, got married, they know this passage. Love is patient and kind. It's not jealous or boastful. It's not arrogant or rude. Love does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrong, but rejoices in the right. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. So faith, hope, and love abide these three. But the greatest of these is love. We like those words. I like those words. But they are very different from the romantic view of love that we normally are fed. <clears throat> if you read through them, they're not touchy-feely. Scott Peck, the psychiatrist minister, picked up on Paul's words 
to define love this way. Love is the will to extend oneself for the purpose of nurturing one's own or another's spiritual growth. Love's not an accident. It's not a feeling. It is something we do. It's something that we choose to do. And like anything else, it's not something that we just know how to do. Now, I know how to ride a bicycle. I can go out right now and jump on a bike and ride away, but I still have a really nasty scar on my left knee about the spill I took when I was six. See, it took a lot of rides through our yard with my father holding on to the back of the seat before I was able to ride that bike. Riding a bike was something I had to learn. And it's the same thing with love. It's, it's one of those, not one of those things that just comes naturally. We go downstairs this morning to our nursery. And we see our adorable children down there. Our babies are just wonderful. They're cute as they can be. But they just can't love. Not yet. They eat, wet, sleep, slobber. They live in their own little world. That's their natural state. We want to live in our world. We want the world to take care of us. It takes a real effort on our part to move beyond that. And be aware that if we move beyond that, it's risky. It means that you might be... No, it means that you will be hurt. C.S. Lewis reminded us and warned us, to love at all is to be vulnerable. Love anything and your heart will certainly be wrung and possibly be broken. If you want to make sure of keeping your heart intact, you must give it to no one, not even an animal. Wrap it carefully around with hobbies and little luxuries and avoid all entanglements. Lock it up safe in the casket or coffin of your own selfishness. But in that casket, safe, dark, motionless, airless, it will change. It will not be broken. It will become unbreakable, impenetrable, irredeemable. The only safe place outside heaven where you can be perfectly safe from all the dangers of love is hell. When we love, when we love, there's a chance that we will be hurt. Just like riding a bike or walking or driving a car or swimming or doing all the things that make life life. We might be hurt. And the only way to learn to love is to practice, to watch others, to learn from their examples, to model ourselves after them. That's why we need church, why we need each other. We need to be able to watch people who have loved long, who have, have learned to get past the myths, to love others. We need their example. We need your example. Dave Simmons tells the story of taking his children to a shopping mall near their home. As they drove up, there was a big sign that said, Petting Zoo. And his children were all excited and asked, Daddy, 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 can we go? Can we go? Please, 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 can we go? Now, this petting zoo was a great place for the kids to stay. They were fenced in with all kinds of little furry creatures, safe and secure, children, both children and pets. While mom and dad went in and did their shopping, not distracted by small children. Sure, he said, and he flipped them both a quarter. He walked into Sears. A few minutes later, though, he said, I turned and my daughter was right there with me. He was surprised that she would prefer the hardware section 
than the petting zoo. But that was not the case, and so he, he asked her, Honey, what's wrong? She looked up at him with those giant brown eyes and said, Well, Dad, it, it cost 50 cents. <laughs> so I gave Brandon my quarter. Then she said the most beautiful thing he had ever heard. She repeated their family motto. The family motto, you see, is love is action. She had given her brother her quarter. And no one, he says, loves furry little animals than Helen. But she had done it because she had seen it played out. She had watched her mother give her father the last piece of pie and say, love in action. She had watched her parents do and say, love is action for years and years around the house. She had heard and seen love in action, and now she had incorporated it into her little lifestyle. It had become part of her. And then Simmons goes on to tell the rest of the story. He writes, As soon as I finished my errand, I took Helen to the petting zoo. We stood by the fence and watched Brandon go crazy, just petting and feeding the animals. And Helen stood there with her hands and chin resting on the fence and just watched her brother. I had 50 cents burning a hole in my pocket. I never offered it to Helen, and she never asked. Because she, she knew the whole family motto. It's, it's not love in action. It's love is sacrificial action. Love always pays a price. Love always costs something. Love is expensive. And when you love, benefits accrue to another's account. Love is for you, not me. Love gives. It doesn't grab. Helen gave her quarter to Brandon, and she wanted to follow through with the lesson. She knew she had to taste the sacrifice. She wanted to experience that total family motto. Love is sacrificial action. You see... Love cost. It always has. Just ask God. Amen. This is a special day in the life of our church. Because this is the day in which we welcome one of our own into full membership of our congregation. Hunter Opal comes this morning to become a part of our congregation. And so, as he comes, invite us to join together in our rite of confirmation. It's found on 171 in our hymnals. Hunter, would you join me down here? Let me find our place. Thank you. Hunter, in the presence of God in this congregation, do you confirm the covenant in which you were baptized? Rely on the Holy Spirit to strengthen and guide you into ever-increasing maturity in your relationship with Christ and the church? Let us pray. Almighty God, you have received Hunter into your covenant through baptism. You have provided for his growth, enlightened his mind with your truth, and enabled him to offer himself to you. We ask that you accept the vow they have made today, defend and strengthen him with your Holy Spirit, empower him for your service, and sustain him all the days of his life. Amen. Amen.
at the end of our services each week, you hear these words in some form. Now I pray that the Lord will bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance to you and give you peace. Hunter, by affirming your baptismal covenant in public worship today, you have taken another step in your journey with God. You have entered into a new relationship with God in this congregation. We charge you in God's name always to remain faithful to Christ and the church and to be open to the leading of the Holy Spirit. Hunter, years ago, times ago, you were baptized. From that moment on, for always, you have been a beloved child of God. You went through confirmation, and you could have joined the church then. But you said you weren't quite ready. Now you said you are. That is a gift. That is a gift to all these people who have loved you forever and have been a part of your growing up days. Now you take a different step. You have said you want to be a part of them. You are now a full member of this congregation. That means you have responsibilities now. You've already helped. Oh, I didn't know about that, did you? You thought this was just a, yeah. <clears throat> You've already helped us. You have helped us lead in worship. But now I pray that you will and hope and ask you to continue to live out your faith among us. That we look forward to the ways and seeing how God is going to use you and bless you. We look forward to the ways in which you are going to teach us about what it means to be Christian, to be a follower of Christ. And we, we promise to do our best to be a good example for you, to help you know what love looks like, what being a disciple of Christ looks like. We have a few more things in worship. I'm, I'm going to ask you to sit down for a second. <clears throat> and then at the end of the service, I'm going to ask Hunter to be here with his family, with all of our youth. All of our youth have now official members of our church. And so <clears throat> I'm going to ask them to be here and for you to come and, and speak a word of encouragement to Hunter, of gratitude, just to welcome him into, into the full membership of our church. Thank you, Hunter. Oh, but, but, don't. <laughs> Normally at this time, we, were, we would present him with a Bible. We've already done that. Hunter wanted one earlier after confirmation because he said, I want to study. So he's been studying. So it's a small gift to remind you of this day and our prayers and blessings to you. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> I know, but I want this for a second. <laughs> no, you <can> say. <laughs> I forgot. Yes. Will you stand if you're able and join us in singing hymn 601?
Again, thank you for joining us in worship this morning. We do pray that you will rush out from here and buy your Valentine's cards. No, that we will go from this place living out the love of God to all that we meet, to our world. And that way, being the incarnation of God in our world, that our world so needs. We go. So I told Hunter, these are some words that we've heard over and over again in this place. May we hear them again as we go, our benediction. You are the people of God. So go now, and as you go, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May God give you grace never to sell yourself short. Grace to risk something big for something good. Grace to remember that our world is too dangerous for anything but truth and too small for anything but love. So go now, and as you go, may the Lord take your hands and work through them. May the Lord take your lips and speak through them. May the Lord take your hearts and set them on fire, both now and forevermore. Mm -hmm.